And if it's OK, then I will pass over to Hayley, who is Conservation Officer at Bug Life and will give a bit of an overview, overview of the national bee lines. Over to you, Hayley, if that's OK. OK, uh, thank you very much, Kate. OK, I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that OK? I yes. can see it, yes. Lovely. OK, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hayley Herridge and um, yes, I'm Conservation Officer at Bug Life. I'm based in Bristol. Uh, I work on various sort of projects for Bug Life, uh, including developing beelines projects alongside colleagues in England. And I was involved in the um, the seven beelines development. So I'm really pleased to see that we, we got the money for that. And um, yeah, really uh, great to have Kate um, and Caitlin on board to deliver that project. So Bug Life is the only organisation in Europe devoted to the conservation of all invertebrates. Our aim is to stop invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates. Today, um, I'm going to talk to you about some of our conservation work aimed at tackling the crisis our UK pollinators face. Uh, bees, butterflies, hoverflies and other pollinating insects are all absolutely essential. Uh, they pollinate our crops and enable us to produce food that we eat and they pollinate our wildflowers, bringing colour and kind of life to our countryside. There's actually a huge diversity of insects that can be considered pollinators, including bees, flies, hoverflies, butterflies and moths, wasps, sawflies and beetles. And entomologist Stephen Falk believes there are around, or at least, so I should say, 6,000 species that are known to regularly uh, visit flowers and therefore, or known to, sorry, or likely to um, carry pollen between flowers. Uh, now, we've all heard about the dramatic declines in insects, particularly declines in distribution of, of insects and kind of other wildlife. Um, but until recently, there was kind of uh, less information about it, the abundance of, of insects. And so I just included a slide about this recent study, which I think really hits home this year of abundance lost over a relatively short period of time. This is actually within my niece's lifetime, which I find quite, quite staggering. So this study took place in German nature reserves recording biomass each year, and it revealed a 75% decline in flying insects insect biomass over a 27 year period, which is absolutely, yeah, staggering. And so why are pollinators in decline? Well, there are many reasons that they're really up against it, if you like. Uh, the main reason, though, is, is habitat lost. We've um, lost 97% of our flower-rich grasslands in the UK since the 1930s. And what remains is very fragmented and isolated. Um, we also have the increasing or ever increasing dependence on chemicals, pesticides and herbicides within agriculture and, and other sectors. Um, and, you know, some of these chemicals have huge impacts on, on insects and those that are systemic can also uh, get into the water and uh, basically uh, make other, other kind of wildlife, other wild plants and things like that toxic to bees as well as uh, the plants that they were initially kind of sprayed on. There's also non-native species that so particularly plants that may outcompete our native species. There are some pollinators that are very specialist and rely on certain plants um, for nesting habitat or, or forage material. There's disease and parasites as well that come from uh, commercially reared honeybees and bumblebees that are then released um, or escape into the wild, uh, spreading spreading the diseases and parasites uh, amongst our native kind of wild pollinators and climate change. Um, and climate change, obviously, we are seeing these freak kind of weather uh, events as well as decoupling of pollinators from the plants which they're associated with. Um, you know, causing kind of pollinators to emerge at uh, times, emerging, sorry, it's at different times to kind of flowering. 
Uh, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to put the wildflowers back. Basically, it's it's that kind of simple. Um, and we need to put them back in the, the right places. Uh, this way, our efforts can help restore the connectivity that is needed to help encourage thriving populations of pollinators that are able to move across the landscape. Oh, let's just go back. And connectivity is, is absolutely key to this. Um, as it increases the permeability of the landscape, if you like, which is, you know, crucial for all wildlife to be able to find food, shelter, uh, nesting habitat and overwintering habitat and to build resilience to the impacts of climate change. And as well as connectivity, we need to increase the sheer amount of wildflower rich habitat to ensure and we also need to ensure diversity of habitats so that we can support healthy populations of of insects and we need this habitat to be of high quality so to put it simply we need bigger better and more joined up Now, um, this slide may look a little confusing, but once I've explained what's going on, hopefully you'll find it interesting. I, 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 I do find it personally very interesting. Um, this is sort of some of the science that supports bee lines, um, and it was carried out by the um, Liverpool University during the early days of the bee lines project. And it's kind of sh it's showing the range, um, the speed of range of expansion of species uh, within imaginary scenarios within different kind of habitat distributions and so I'll kind of make sort of better sense of that now if you cast your eye on the uh, bottom left hand box there you can see two black blobs um, and those are kind of two blocks of habitat if you like and there's kind of very poor connectivity between them and if you look at the chart there you can see that the speed of range of expansion uh, within the landscape is very slow and it, it, the permeability kind of opportunities are, are very poor. And then if you look above that at the next box, um, you can see kind of, and it's it's not very clear, but little dots, kind of little fragmented bits of habitat, poorly connected, um, which again, is this is more similar to what our kind of landscape actually looks like in terms of where the good habitat is. Um, but again, doesn't allow for very good kind of species dispersal um, and colonisation of kind of new new sites. We then have that kind of cross at the top, and this is the the, the computer's kind of dream. And obviously, this isn't um, a realistic scenario in the actual landscape. But then, if you look at the top right, we have the this sort of continuum, this kind of chain of habitat, um, and this is something that is realistic. And if you then look at the chart, you can see that actually the, the speed of range of expansion has increased and also the conductivity has increased as well. So this is, you know, the science that kind of backs that this continuum of habitat, this idea of connectivity across the landscape is really the best approach to assist species dispersal. Um, so corridors, chains, stepping stones, you know, allow this rapid movement of species um, across the landscape, as well as maintaining strong populations on individual habitat patches. Here's our here's our animation. Oh, um, Haley, I can't hear the animation. Oh, OK. Um, well, I tell you what. Sorry about that. I'll just move on then and we'll play it at the end. I'll set it up on to play via YouTube. Sorry about that. Um, it normally it normally plays plays a sound. I'm not quite sure how to kind of fix that, fix that problem. Um, but that was our new animation that we've had made that we're very, very proud of. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you kind of later, later in the evening. It just introduces beelines as the kind of solution to the, um, to the issues that our pollinators are facing. So this slide here shows the, the, the completed UK map. And this is a very recent achievement of which we're really, really uh, proud of. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background on beelines before we go into what beelines um, are. 
So it all kind of started in 2011 when our first uh, Beelines mapping effort was piloted in North Yorkshire and it included working closely with academics to underpin the kind of the guiding principles of Beelines with, with research and science. Um, this was just the sort of first part of the jigsaw, if you like, and, and then since then we've seen county and region and region be answered one by one. In, in 2018, Wales became the first country to be completely mapped um, with help from the Welsh Government and then following on from that, Northern Ireland uh, was mapped with, with help from the Northern Ireland uh, Environment Agency. And then in the last 12 months, uh, with help from DEFRA, we have completed the, the map for England, uh, mapping all the kind of outstanding counties. And then very recently, we completed the Scotland uh, map with help from the ESB Fairburn Foundation. And so now we have this completed map. This is a huge milestone for us because, yes, we've been working on it a very, very long time and a hugely symbolic moment for pollinator conservation. So what are bee lines? Here's, um, here's an example of, of some bee lines in the south. Bee lines actually stands for biodiversity lines. So this isn't this isn't about bees. This is about creating connected habitat for biodiversity. Um, so the bee lines, as you can see here, it's this sort of connected network uh, reaching every corner of the UK, uh, covering every county. And they provide a focus and a guide for the national effort to restore and create habitat for pollinators. Each bee line is three kilometres wide and they take in the kind of the best remaining wildflower rich habitats within our landscape. So we, we you know, we've noted where all our nature reserves are and our um, special sites for scientific interest with the aim of then being able to build and expand around these to increase habitat and improve the quality and the connectivity between these sites. The development of the network is based on national and local habitat data sets and is guided by local knowledge um, through, through con uh, consultation. And really the, I think, the best thing about bee lines in a way is that it's one single straightforward map um, for the whole country available online, which everyone can contribute towards. And if we can assure that 10% of every bee line is filled uh, with wildflower rich habitats, then we can restore, restore sorry, the connectivity that our pollinators need to thrive. So just a little bit about the mapping. Um, to map the bee lines, we sourced as much data as we could from national and local data sets. We wanted to know where the best habitat in the, the country was for pollinators, um, including sort of chalk grasslands, lowland meadows, uh, heathland, um, sand dunes and scrub, as well as the less kind of beneficial um, habitats as well. We then highlighted those habitats of importance so that we were able to identify where those core areas were within each county. Um, and then we used some software to help us understand the landscape permeability around these core areas. Uh, different land uses, you know, such as urban, um, agricultural, uh, were, were scored, um, which enabled the software then to look at kind of the paths of re least resistance, if you like, between these kind of core, hab core patches of habitat. We were then able to take the maps to local stakeholder workshops um, because as well as using the modelling, um, you know, that that's all well and good, but you you really need to get that local expertise and and local knowledge um, in order to ensure that you're creating a network in the right places. So we brought partners from each county together to interpret these maps and to make a truly localised network. Um, and in actual fact, the kind of the whole of the Beelines network is based upon locally produced maps so that, you know, and which will connect sort of a regional and country level, but um, they ensure that local priorities are, are included. And Beelines 
really, you know, this it's a shared endeavour. This isn't something that Bug Life can do alone. It needs the support and buy-in of everyone who wants to save um, our much-loved pollinating insects. That is why already to date we have worked with hundreds of partners um, to map the beelines network. We've been working with conservation organisations, local authorities, strategy agencies, land managers and other stakeholders who know their lo local landscapes. And we also currently have lots of projects taking place across the UK. I don't have time to go into detail on those now, so I just wanted to share one with you as a case study, which is the work that we've been doing in the west of England, Beelines with Avon Wildlife Trust. This is our longest standing partnership. Um, we've been working with them since 2014. And in that time, we have undertaken a range of, of different projects, including one that was kind of focused on um, restoring uh, local wildlife sites, on uh, projects that have focused within the southern Cotswolds, the Mendip Hills and the Bath and um, Bristol Urban Fringe. And so there's been a, a range of projects and over that time, 230 hectares of pollinator habitat has been restored and when I say habitat, this includes grasslands, um, hedgerows, trees, scrub, uh, bee banks have been built. And a staggering 317 volunteer task days have been held um, with 540 individuals. And all of that equates to 3,160 days of volunteer time. Um, we are now at the point with the West of England bee lines um where we can start to look at where the gaps are so we're at a quite an exciting stage um and i also wanted to mention that you know beelines isn't the only nature recovery map out there there are others and the, with the new environment bill you know th there are going to be a lot, you know, there's there's big ambitions for, for nature's recovery, and it's really important that bee lines is embedded to these other mapping exercises, which is what has happened in the west of England. So the the grassland kind of um priority grassland network within the West of England ecological um network map um aligns with with the bee lines work. And this is really important because it, it just ensures that all organizations that are you know working to restore habitats are collaborating basically and singing from the same hymn sheet so this is what's happening in the west of england um and we're now looking at yeah where the where the map where the um restoration work has taken place in order to look at where the gaps are which will inform future kind of project work um and so finally we um with uh with our map complete uh the task is now to use uh that map to inspire and infuse local communities and decision makers to act for pollinators we launched the map about six weeks ago uh which is a real sort of turning point for us um in terms of you know our efforts because it means that we can start, you know, really delivering on the on the ground. Uh, we created a, a new report which sort of tells all about beelines. So I'd really encourage you to read that and you can find that via the beelines page on our website. And, and beelines can be delivered across the UK in so many ways, and we're confident that we can succeed everywhere. So on larger scales, we want to see agricultural landscapes transform so they don't just produce the food that we need, but also crucially the wildflower rich habitats um, that our pollinators and other wildlife need. And this includes the transformation of fields, you know, back to species rich grassland through restoration of locally sourced um, seed and green hay. And, you know, longer term projects that support pollinators in field margins and unproductive areas on agricultural land. Um, so that kind of leads nicely now on to Kate introducing the um, Seven B Lines project. And if you have any questions, we can answer them at the end. Thanks so much, Hayley. Yeah, that's a, a really helpful uh, background uh, setting to yeah, the overarching framework that Seven B Lines is sitting within. 
Uh, right, I will share my screen, hopefully fairly smoothly. Um, can everyone see that? Can, Hayley, can you see that? Yes, yep, yeah, that's good. Brilliant. Um, just quickly, sorry, a little bit of administration. Hayley, would you mind taking over the um, lobby area? Because I think some people are still arriving. Um, sure, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, just for those uh, that have arrived a little late, uh, my name's Kate. I'm the um, conservation officer and the project officer for the Seven Bee Lines project. Um, I did say at the start, and I think everybody's um, everybody's aware, but um, just for those late arrivers, we are recording this event. Uh, it's something that I have to uh, say, uh, so just make sure that your camera and your microphone is off and, and we'll all be fine. But this will be recorded and made available on our, on our YouTube afterwards. Um, so basically, I'm going to do a bit of a run through of what Seven Beelines is um, and what we're planning to do this year, how you can get involved and what you can do on your own patch as well with uh, an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so basically, uh, after Hayley's uh, brilliant presentation about uh, the Beelines network, so the mapping has been achieved and, and that's no small feat basically, that's, that's a huge achievement and um, to have that map for the whole country is quite uh, staggering really and now we've got to start delivering we've got to start populating those bee lines as they're doing in the west of england so uh seven bee lines is that for shropshire basically um just a bit of background uh so it's myself and the intern caitlin elverson who started on monday who were representing bug life in shropshire and we'll be delivering the project together um, it's particularly exciting uh, because I'm a Shropshire born lass, so I'm really happy to be working in my home county and delivering such a fantastic landscape scale project. Um, it's the first project in the West Midlands, which is also exciting, and um, it's a green recovery challenge uh, funded project, um, which is administrated by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, so that's great. You, a lot of you may remember Boris Johnson talking about shovel ready projects. Um, that was going that would be awarded that money that was released in the green recovery challenge fund so we're one of those so introducing seven b lines um shropshire residents will probably recognize uh the locations in the background that's basically the shropshire b lines map um hitting some key um urban areas and and heading through our countryside connecting up our our triple si's and our, our nature reserves and our key uh, invertebrate and wildflower rich habitats. As you can see, that is a quite a lot of um, pollinator highway to populate. Um, so we're starting small but focused. Um, and when I say small, um, small on, on, a, on a massive scale, <laughs> it's still quite a lot. Um, we're basically working between Bridge North and Telford this year and we want spillover benefits to the rest of the county. Um, so we're focusing in on that area. We're going to do a really good job and um, we'll share those lessons learnt and that knowledge and those experiences with the rest of the county. Uh, and we want to engage local communities. So we want to harness pe people power to give power to pollinators. And this is going to be our contribution, the Shropshire's contribution to the creation of a national pollinator highway. So not only will it create beautiful wildflower filled landscapes, for us uh, and connectivity through Shropshire, but it's going to mean a more resilient um, network for our pollinators and other wildlife to adapt to climate change, um, bounce back from those horrific declines that um, Hayley was uh, mentioning. And also perhaps we can get to where the West of England is in a few years time and, and have Shropshire um, pretty much connected up. That would be incredible. So, First off the bat, introducing our partners. So as Hayley mentioned before, Bug Life cannot do this on our own. And um, we've got some fantastic people working with us in Shropshire. Uh, first off, Shropshire Wildlife Trust, who are our delivery partner and are providing a lot of support in terms of uh, event delivery and support, um, restoration planning and providing that crucial local knowledge as well as um, access to donor sites. There's a little bit of jargon, which I will bust later, um, such as donor sites. So um, there's a bit of a jargon busting slide. So I'll um, I'll head to that later. 
Uh, we're also working with Apley Park, Apley Estates, um, who are a large estate that sit between Bridge North and Telford, and their estate pretty much falls almost completely on the B line. And they actually approached Bug Life, um, really excited that that they were fortunate enough to be within a bee line and really keen to be involved. And they took up the mantle themselves really. And uh, we've we've developed the project uh, with them. So it's it's brilliant to have such a buy-in of such a large landowner. So it fits in with their um, wider ecological and environmental goals. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of work with them. And also Telford and Reekin Council, who uh, are, pro are also providing an amenity grassland site for restoration and uh, a fantastic site uh, it's in the it's a beautiful area it's already um providing a lot for wildlife and for the local area and um that's a fantastic opportunity to get local engagement and um get people seeing what's happening on their doorstep and how it's how it's contributing to landscape connectivity so our restoration sites uh, so here's a couple of maps. Uh, maps. So we've got Rough Park, which is Telford and Reeking uh, Council owned. Um, and uh, basically, we're going to be doing some work there um, using green hay from one part of the park, which is also already quite species rich. We're going to be cutting that uh, and transporting it to another prepared receptor site on the um, on the park. Uh, spreading that, the seed will drop out and uh, be rolled in basically. And we'll also be working with the community to seed yellow rattle. Um, so that's uh, that's what we're doing there. And uh, you can see that it's surrounded by housing estates. So this is a great opportunity for local communities to come get involved. And we will be running events uh, and there'll be more about that later on in the presentation. And then just down the way, uh, you've got Rough Park here, and then down the way, um, you've got Apley Estates. And you can see here that there's, uh, there's sites highlighted in yellow and also sites highlighted in a light green. Uh, basically, the sites highlighted in yellow are permanent grassland, uh, which means it's, it's never been ploughed, but it has lost its species richness in that location just due to uh, perhaps slightly intensive grazing. Um, which has meant uh, a reduction in, in the species richness of the of the grassland. So we'll be doing some restoration on that. And then the lighter green stuff will be arable margins. So filling them with wildflowers, um, more robust uh, flowers that can handle those higher nutrient levels in the arable margins and compete with the grasses. Um, so things like wild carrot and knapweed uh, and such like and, and some vetches that will um, that will thrive in those areas and provide a really vital uh, forage, nectar forage for pollinators. So heading up right the way up uh, the River Severn uh, through that corridor there. Um, we're also creating a pollinator garden with Apley Park, um, which we'll move on to next. Um, this is something really exciting. Um, it's located outside Apley's farm shop. Um, some of you may know it. And uh, this is, we are very much at the beginning stages. So it looks a little underwhelming at the moment. It's a bit of bare ground and some and some sleepers put in, in, in the corner. Um, but we're using the principles of this little picture here below, uh, just that complexity of habitat uh, and offering of different types of food and different types of um, niches within a small area to, to help our pollinators. And basically, it's just going to be a place to relax uh, for people who are visiting the estate, as well as learn about pollinators and wildlife gardening. We're also going to have a demonstration meadow there because a lot of the work at Apley um, is on the estate and won't be able to be seen by the general public. So this is a really good area for them to tell everybody about what they're doing uh, and why. And um, it's going to be a learning resource to be used by local schools. So we'll be holding school events here and teaching uh, children uh, about uh, the diversity of pollinators and um, what they, the complexity of, of habitats that they require. So what does restoration look like? Um, so this is something, there have been a couple of things I've said that uh, that could be jargony, I suppose. So this is the jargon busting slide. So first off, species rich grassland. Um, 
when we walk through the countryside, a lot of what we see are big green fields um, with very little floral diversity in them. And uh, Hayley mentioned in her slides that we've lost, I think, 97% of wildflower rich grassland um, in her niece's lifetime, which is, is staggering. So, you know, these these kind of pictures here with these beautiful flowers used to be more commonplace, but they're harder to find now. And they were kind of becoming resigned to nature reserves um, and, you know, a few tr traditionally managed hay meadow sites. Um, and quite a few years ago now, there was a bit of a switch uh, in conservation, which Hayley mentioned uh, when the Lawton report came out about bigger, better and more joined up. And uh, we had to switch from a kind of idea of, of managing these nature reserves and realising that our wider countryside also had to provide for wildlife um, and that we needed that connectivity back. Um, a nature reserve marooned by either urban parks or roads or buildings or, or intensive agricultural land, um, which is very um, species poor, just wasn't going to protect, um, wasn't going to protect us against the severe biodiversity declines we're witnessing. We need those species to be able to move. They, they need to move through connected corridors or there needs to be a stepping stone effect in our landscape um, so that uh, species don't become marooned and unable to uh, respond to looking for food, shelter, a mate, or responding to more serious issues like um, climate change. So basically, species-rich grassland is, you know, a floristically diverse grassland. Um, however, they can become poor by um, fertiliser. Um, as we've wanted to grow more food, uh, farmers have been more keen to get really vigorous growing grasses going. And uh, they kind of dominate the sward, the grass sward. So you get these big green fields. Um, so what we want to do is get that diversity back. And in some cases, uh, like at Apley Estate on the permanent grass and that nev that's never been ploughed, but it's lost its species diversity through um, perhaps too much intensive grazing, uh, we can get that back. And um, I've said a couple of things like donor sites. So what we're planning to do at Apley after we've done the soil testing and realised what the recipe is of our soil and um, what's going on chemically and what the soil type is, that will inform us of what we can do. But basically... We want to prepare that ground this year, so we want to create quite a lot of bare ground, um, either through chain harrow harrowing or power harrowing, or you can even do it through very intensive grazing. Basically, you want to open up that bare ground so there's lots of uh, opportunities for germination and seed contact. And then when we're talking about um, donor sites, we're talking about already really well established species rich grassland, which we can take a hay cut off um, and use as local provenance seed uh, that's of a similar habitat type. And uh, that just means that you're keeping that local character, uh, that local assemblage of flowers, which our pollinators have um, evolved to uh, deal with, basically respond to in partnership with. Um, we can spread that green hay and then we can aftermath graze it and these are a couple of the tools here, you know, uh, cattle and especially native breed cattle like Highland cattle are the best. Um, you can have them, they'll trample the seed into the ground, they'll selectively graze, um, they'll move through the field and, and graze quite sensitively um, and they're quite light on the ground despite what they look like. And uh, they're really great tools for um, getting that seed trampled in, keeping the grass down, you take them off, uh, early the next year and hopefully those seeds have germinated, the grass has been reduced enough and um, you can start getting that species diversity back in and then with the correct management, with the correct uh, level of grazing or a hay cut, you can start seeing that, that species rich grassland picking up year over year. I'll just mention another tool that we'll use, a natural tool, and that's yellow rattle, uh, renanthus. Uh, yellow rattle is often called the meadow maker. Um, it's a plant that parasitizes grass. So you'll often see it in uh, meadows. It's called yellow rattle because when it goes to seed uh, and you walk through a hay meadow, you hear, you'll hear that rattling of the seeds in their seed cases. Um, so yellow rattle just basically parasitizes the grassland. Um, and once it takes hold in, in a grassland, it will suppress that vigorous grass growth and basically allow lots of space for, for wildflowers to come through. 
So hopefully that's a bit of jargon busting there, um, and and what we're hoping to achieve on the um, on the permanent grasslands at um, Apley Park and at um, Rough Park with Telford and Recon Council. And then crucially, how can you get involved? So we really want to, as I said at the start, we really want to get people involved. We want people to know what's going on on their doorstep, uh, that they are going to be contributing to something big, um, something that's uh, going to connect up our landscapes and really help our wildlife. And also just to connect with nature. We're, um, we're experiencing a biodiversity decline and there's lots of terms um, being kicked around at the moment, um, eco grief and eco anxiety. Um, and they are really serious issues uh, now. And um, this disconnection with um, uh, the outdoors and our wildlife is, is quite a serious um, epidemic, I suppose, uh, across our country. So connecting people with their local spaces and um, knowing that nature is on your doorstep, it doesn't have to be somewhere else exciting. It's right there for you to see. Um, you just sometimes need the gate opened, really. So that's what we're hoping to aim to do and also empower local people to be part to be part of Beelines. So we're going to be having a busy events program that will just uh, see us doing lots of fun stuff uh, for families and and um, school children and such like. There's one little girl in that picture that looks absolutely determined to catch something. I think I'd be terrified if I was a bee. And also working with local communities to have plug, plant, plug planting and seeding events so that they're actually involved in the practical restoration of, of grasslands in their area. Um, we'll be appearing at events with stalls, so please do keep an eye out for us at, at local shows. And um, we'll be offering training as well, so um, training in botanical survey and monitoring, and also um, in the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme FITS counts, so that's flower insect timed counts. Um, it's a very um, simple citizen science uh, survey methodology um, that aims to give a bit of a picture on on how our pollinators are doing so we would like to get some people trained up on that and um get people looking what's happening on their doorstep and um submitting that data basically um i'll just check my notes um and yes and we'll also be working with schools at the apley estate uh using that pollinator garden as a bit of a uh, educational resource I can let you know a bit more later how to get involved, um, so I'll come to that at the end. And obviously, again, what Hayley mentioned, Bug Life can't do this on their own, and they are definitely not doing it on their own. And there's already uh, a great deal happening in Shropshire and some really inspiring stuff going on. Um, I've had the fortune to uh, chat to a couple of people from these various different groups. Um, the Stepping Stones project with the National Trust is a really ambitious landscape connectivity project um, where they're looking to connect up the Long Mind and the Stiper Stones to allow wildlife to move between those two key sites. Uh, Restoring Shropshire's Verges project is just uh, an amazing project driven by local people's passion uh, to get uh, these linear habitats uh, as, in as best condition as possible. So adopting road verges and getting them into the correct management, um, lobbying local council to change their management regimes and um, yeah, using linear features to create good habitat is fits exactly into beeline. So that's some brilliant work. And um, yeah, those kind of unloved spaces that can be used for wildlife uh, is, a, is a fantastic way to get more wildflowers into the countryside. And landowners, um, I had the good fortune of presenting to North Shropshire Farmers Group about beelines the other day and also hearing about the work they're doing. And when we talk about wildflower rich habitat, we do tend to think of meadows and grassland, but it also can be scrub and um, hedgerows and trees. And uh, they've got a huge uh, project uh, where they're looking at getting trees for pollinators, uh, lots of hedgerows into good management. And um, that's all the work that they're doing, land, landowners coming together to work at a landscape scale. And that's also something that we'll be encouraging and facilitating through the project, um, through um, various workshops. Caring for God's Acre, uh, I had the good fortune of going out with them the other day to do some scything um, near the Long Mind. And 
I had an image that it would be in the sunshine and there'd be butterflies flying around uh, and it wasn't. It was hailing, as you can see in that picture, and we all had our hoods up and just scything away with our heads down, really. But yeah, they're training people in, in traditional skills. Uh, they manage um, burial grounds mainly uh, for species richness. So they use um, they usually do scything, so using the traditional techniques to um, to manage grassland as best as possible for species richness and local councils are getting involved as well i've spoken to a few who have uh, who are really wanting to get on board and manage their amenity grasslands and uh, grassland areas uh, better for wildlife there'll definitely be people i've missed off there i'm still um getting a picture of what's happening in um, shropshire but there's lots of exciting stuff going on and it's great to hear about it so what can you do um, there's quite a few things and uh, yeah, there's, a, there's lots of opportunity to get involved with the project, but also to work on your own patch. So basically, I'd love it if everyone at this webinar went home and had a look, uh, went home, we are, we are all at home, <laughs> um, had a look whether you are on a beeline uh, um, and uh, basically uh, see what you can uh, do and what you can log on there. I will say at this point that um, whether you're on a beeline or off a beeline, it is still crucial that you do what you can uh, with what you've got. Um, you know, wildflowers everywhere are critical now to um, reversing the decline of our pollinators. Um, it's just that beelines does give a bit of focus and um, it's that strategic placement of where that kind of wildflower create wildflower rich habitat creation will have the most bang for its buck basically. But please do um, put flowers in everywhere, wherever you can. Um, get on board, plant, plant up a plant pot, um, you know, leave a corner of your garden, go wild, um, don't mow your lawn as much as um, as much as we as we want to do. But on the subject of gardens, um, Basically, whatever size you have, whatever size garden you have, you can get involved. And just to explain how crucial gardens are, um, I've got this from Dave Golson's book, Gardening for Bumblebees. But basically, Britain has about 22 million gardens and 300,000 allotments, which amount to about half a million hectares of land. That is huge. If we could all do something in our gardens, that would have a profound impact. Um, and the best thing about it is there are options for all sizes of garden and all for all types of gardener. If you're somebody who likes to be out there all the time, then there's something for you. If you're somebody that doesn't really want to do much, then there's definitely something for you. So uh, here's some of the things that you can do. Um, so firstly, what, what do pollinators need? So I, th I think the key term is complexity. Um, the more complexity you have uh, in, in a habitat, the, the better really. Um, so pollinators basically need three things. They need to be able to forage and to get nectar. Um, they need to be able to reproduce and um, they need to be able to find uh, a hibernation site. So the con working to make sure all of those things are delivered. So flowers, making sure that there's uh, nectar forage throughout the year, through all the seasons, and that there's an abundance of flowers and lots of different types of flowers is, is crucial. Um, reproduction, uh, food plants are key. Um, so there's quite a few um, key food plants and there's lots of wildlife gardening resources now, but making sure that you've got those those things in your garden is absolutely brilliant. Nesting sites, so I mean, it could be anything from messy corners to log piles to, you know, the, the, the bee hotels that we see being made now. Um, bee banks, uh, bare ground, there's quite a lot you can do and I'll, I'll go into that in a bit. Um, and, and nesting materials, so uh, just thinking about, um, you know, leaf cutter bees and making sure that there's uh, plants for them. The wool carder bee particularly likes the flower lamb's ear to, to make their nest. Um, so there's uh, there's lots of stuff to think about and there's, you can get as interested, as, you can get as in depth as you like. That's the great thing about it. You can do quite little and still have a, a, a good impact or you can get really carried away and think about absolutely everything and just get hours of enjoyment out of wildlife gardening. First off, weeds are great. We have a strange attitude towards a lot of our wildflowers where we inexplicably decide that they're weeds. Um, 
Another kind of uh, to coin a phrase from Dave Golson, if you want to get all, rid of all the weeds in your garden, just start calling them wildflowers and hey presto, all your weeds are gone. Um, but yes, uh, put the mower down, put the strimmer down and let the weeds flower. Um, so dandelions are an absolutely brilliant early foraging source for, for lots of um, pollinators. So let's learn to love weeds um, and love a little bit of um, messiness over neatness. So if you're the more avid gardener, there's there's plenty, there's plenty to do. So do plant nectar rich flowers that offer foraging opportunities throughout the year. Um, that one pictured there is lungwort and is just a brilliant early nectar source. Um, and avoid bedding plants and plants that are double flowered. Um, I found this useful. If you find it hard to see the middle of a flower, so will a pollinator probably. So these double flowered um, uh, these double petal flowers basically have been bred to look quite showy, but they're really not very good. Sometimes they do have nectar, but it can be very hard to find because there's so many petals. And bedding plants like um, petunias and pansies aren't particularly good. They don't um, they don't provide uh, nectar. So again, like I said, diversity is the spice of life. There's lots of different pollinators lots of different requirements, uh, lots of different mouth parts. So there's short tongues, there's long tongues, there's, uh, they rely on food, on food plants being present for their larval stage. Um, so the more diversity you can have in your garden or your plant pot, the better. Um, so we've got meadow browns on um, devil's bit scabious, little hoverfly on field scabious, um, a bumblebee, I think a garden bumblebee going to foxglove. Um, we've got a holly blue resting on ivy, so um, their food plant is, is is holly, but does become ivy later on in the season. I think a common blue oof, on meadow vetchling, I could be being tested now. And then also let's have, a, let's rethink our attitude to some controversial plants. Um, yes, understandably with, with ragwort, there is some concern around um, uh, livestock. But we've we've got carried away and, and we sometimes lose sight of why we originally um, started to not like a plant and start to see it as a weed and start digging it up wherever it is. Ragwort is actually for not a phenomenal um, food source for so many um, insects. And I think this is just quite a good indicator of how good it can be. You know, there's soldier beetles on here, the burnet moth. And just there, it's a bit blurry. You can see the cinnabar caterpillar. Uh, their food plant is is ragwort. So it really is um, a bit of a buffet for, for all types of, of insects. And um, the umbellifers, uh, which is kind of things like cow parsley and, and wild carrot. They're these big flat headed flowers. They're basically like a landing pad diner for so many insects. Um, and uh, they just provide just a great platform for um, for so many things. So that kind of diversity of flowers is is crucial to get into into your space. And flowers aren't just for summer. So thinking about you know when the queen bees first come out uh, at the start of the year. Um, at the start of the year, if you stand under a, a pussy willow and and listen, you will definitely hear the buzz of hungry queens that have just come out from hibernation. So that early nectar forage is absolutely crucial. So making sure that you have um, things like lungwort, pussy willow, grape hyacinth or muscari, winter flowering heather, um, flowering currant. I won't go through them all, but there's uh, this is not an exhaustive list. And there's so many resources that you can look at um, to uh, to get this um, to get a good list of, of plants to grow. And you know that there's some key ones like comfrey is absolutely brilliant uh, for bees, uh, as is um, borage. I think borage has, it's one of the quickest plants to restock on nectar. So it's just, um, it's like a fast food restaurant. There's always something available. Um, and in autumn and winter, there's definitely things that also flower there. So I've just put a few in um, for people to have a think about. Um, but there's definitely some resources that we can signpost you to and um, lots of stuff on the Bug Life website about gardening as well. Get a bit messy. Again, let's get let's get rid of this idea of being neat and tidy. And actually, you you can have, still have a bit of neat. It looks it's quite a nice contrast having a bit of neatness 
and with messiness. Um, so some leave some wild areas uh, such as long grass, log piles, leaves, and you can create bug homes. Um, lots of solitary bees um, like to you know, use holes in bricks or holes in wood. Uh, the leaf cutter bee, um, the mining bees, uh, will um, mason bees will um, will nest in uh, in these kind of bug hotels. And also, if you leave bare ground or um, create a bee bank, sandy um, sandy banks basically, or loose earth, and a lot of the mining bees will go into those. Um, you know, long grass, common car the common carder bee, I think, will nest in long grass. Um, so there's always something that will use uh, what's naturally messy in your garden. I mean, it goes without saying, avoid too much decking or paving and definitely, definitely steer clear of, of plastic grass and um, give the power tools a rest during the summer. Uh, just sit back and uh, have a cup of tea or, uh, or a drink instead and just watch all the uh, pollinators buzzing around your flowering lawn. Water is always a win. There's only do's when it comes to water. Do introduce a pond. Um, they can be tiny. Even using an old sink or tub is, is good enough. Um, just make sure they've got shallow margins and roots out um, for any unfortunate hedgehogs or anything like that that happen to fall in. As long as it, something can clamber out easily, that's fine. Um, and yeah, do get a few oxygenating plants in there and a few marginal plants. Um, and you'll really see... Uh, there's nothing quite like a pond that will pull wildlife into your garden almost immediately. If you haven't got room for a pond, you could make a hoverfly lagoon. Not quite as attractive because it's basically um, these are really good for uh, ho uh, hoverflies who have their larvae are quite um, romantically called rat tailed maggots. So they uh, tend to breed in in rot holes. So um, you might see a, a hole in a tree that's full of water and has got lots of decaying material at the bottom. Hoverfly lar that l will lay their eggs in there and the, the larvae love it. And they basically have a, a long tail with like a snorkel, which they breathe through and they sit down in the detritus at the bottom of these um, holes. So if you want to create a hoverfly lagoon, you just basically have a small tub of anything really put a lot of um, dead matter in at the bottom, lots of decomposing matter, and then a stick or something um, for, for um, the emerging adult to clamber out on. And you've got yourself a hoverfly lagoon. It's not as nice as a pond, probably a bit stinky, but it's great for great for wildlife. And do get a water butt if you can. Um, yeah, best to try and use harvest water. Um, I mean, we are facing more extreme weather, so let's get hold of that water when it's falling and uh, prepare ourselves for these increasingly drier summers that we're having. Um, it's also best for topping up ponds as well as watering your plants. Um, crucially, no matter what you do in your garden, your garden's never gonna be as good as a peat bog. So don't use uh, peat from a peat bog to, to garden. Uh, please do use peat-free compost or even better make your own. Um, I won't go into the environment, uh, the wildlife benefits of compost heaps, but they're quite, uh, far wide ranging and um, very interesting. Uh, if you want to read uh, Dave Golson's Garden Jungle book, he has a whole chapter about compost heaps and um, it's very enjoyable. But um, yes, excitingly today, they have actually said sales of peat compost to gardeners is to be banned from 2024 amateur to amateur gardeners. So that is really good news. And um, I think a lot of it is still that, that people aren't aware of the damage uh, peat um, compost causes but yeah wherever you can please please do go peat free and also taking that extra step try and buy your plants from somewhere where you know you they've been grown organically and you know they've been grown peat free um i think one of the the, the best things to do is, is get to know other people gardening in your area or your neighbors and you can start doing plant swaps or go to to local plant swaps uh in your village or your local community um, on the farm, so for all the landowners out there, there's um, there's definitely uh, something that obviously can be done in the wider countryside, and it's already going on. Uh, as I chatted about before, there's um, lots of farmers now coming together and working at a landscape scale and having a a kind of group approach to providing habitat uh, on a, on a large scale, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's brilliant to hear that um, some of these groups are taking up beelines as as a focus for where they're going to deliver this work on their farm and through the wider countryside. And I think this will only become 
uh, more encouraged as our agricultural schemes change. Um, the upcoming environmental land management schemes should reward farmers for for provisioning these uh, these habitats. And just for any landowners that are watching, the current countryside stewardship is open at the moment and there's options in there. Please do go over to our website. We've got a farming hub on there, which is really helpful, um, which tells you a bit about the different options that are that are in the scheme for, for pollinators. So hedgerow management, um, taking um, field corners out of production and letting them get a bit rough. Um, yeah, there, there's there's plenty to do, um, and on arable farms, you know, arable margins. Uh, yeah, there's um, there's a lot that can be done on farms, and uh, you know, integrate um, into our food production system so that we still get our food, but also we get um, our pollinator services, and we also um, provide habitat for our natural um, pest controllers. So lots of invertebrates. Um, you know our pred predatory beetles and such like will be helping to um, control some of those um, pests that you get on on farmland. Uh, we will be hosting a landowner workshop later in the year um, after we've delivered our restoration work and it'll be a bit of an opportunity to get people together from across Shropshire um, to talk about lessons learned, network and, um, and have a, a chat about the different techniques for restoration and, and what they can do on their farm. So uh, I can keep everyone posted about that um, and that's something that I think will be uh, really exciting. And in your community, uh, if if you don't have a garden and you're not a, and you're not a farmer, there's still there's still plenty to do. Um, just chatting about beelines would be fantastic. The more people that know about beelines, uh, the better. Um, the more people that know whether if they're on a beelines and get get what they're doing logged on there would be great. Um, Find out what is going on in your local area. I mean, since starting this job, I've realised there's so much going on in Shropshire. There's so many passionate people. Uh, they're willing to share their knowledge. Um, they're willing to get involved. And um, they they basically want people to, to sign up and to help. So um, do have a look uh, at what's going on in your local area. There may already be volunteering opportunities, whether it's with um, a local gardening group or a community gardening group or rest restoring Shropshire's Verges project or caring for God's Acre. Um, there's quite a few um, people already operating in the county and there'll definitely be opportunities with us as well. Um, as I mentioned before, through um, some of the botanical survey training, um, the pollinator counts and uh, local, local involvement when it comes to the actual practical restoration. Um, so please, uh, I've left my contact details at the end. Um, we will be creating a newsletter and a mailing list, list. So if you want to be involved, please do drop me an email and I will put you on our list. Um, as I mentioned, local gardening groups uh, can help with seed sharing, plant swapping and handy tips. So as I mentioned before, the, the more of you that can get together, you can kind of avoid having to buy um, plants that could potentially be grown in, in peat and are absolutely soaked with pesticides. So if you're kind of getting together and swapping plants you know that you're you're getting your hands on some on some good on some good plants that are organically grown and um and doing your best in in your own patch and start to look at how your local areas are managed um from you know amenity grassland you know your parks to road verges and and like i said before there may be a group already working on that or if not, you can contact your lo local council and ask about their management. I think the more people that take an interest and start chatting about this stuff, uh, the more awareness that there will be um, on what best practice is in terms of uh, managing these areas. And crucially, please, please do add your project to our map. So we've got an interactive beelines map that you can find on the Bug Life website on the beelines pages. Uh, this one's for the east and, and midlands of England. You can see that there's a couple of blue dots on there already. So that's that's people putting up um, what they've already done. And basically, I want to see this map absolutely crammed with those blue dots. I'd love to see what people are up to. There's a little bit of a guide so you can log what you're doing. You can put pictures up there. You can put a description and you can just log um, what kind of habitat um, work you're doing. So whether it's wildflower meadow creation or, you know, um, an urban meadow providing building bee hotels, you know, just um, yeah, get on there, uh, put up what you're doing, and um, yeah, I'd love to see, love to see what what the county is up to on on the bee lines. 
And finally, yes, as I said before, please do get in touch. Uh, we're going to have a newsletter and a mailing list and um, it'll be a place to keep you up to speed about where we're going to be in the county, what we're up to, what training courses we've got going on, what events we've got going on. And um, yeah, and, and how you can get involved and hear more and learn more about uh, pollinators and bee lines. Um, yes, really excited to be working here. Uh, can't wait to learn more about the at the county and what's going on and also um, get cracking on our restoration and um, get to meet all of you out there. So thank you very much. Um, I'm not even sure what time it is, but um, if we've ran over a little bit, we have got time for questions. Um, so you can put them in the chat and me and Hayley will do our best to answer them. Thank you very much. Ooh, ooh. Hello, Hayley. Hello, sorry. Hello, sorry. Um, so we, we don't have, we have only um, a couple of questions in the chat for now, which I, I have kind of um, answered, but you may be able to elaborate on a bit further. So I'll just, um, I'll just read this out. So uh, it says, congratulations on your project. Oh. Um, two questions. First, how can I recognise these plots as a visitor? Um, so I think that's talking about the, the restoration plots. And then second, how do farmers react? Are they willing to cooperate? Um, so firstly, the, the 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 plots in terms of Rough Park and Apley Estate, I assume uh, Hen, Henk Jan van der Veen is, is talking about, is that? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, uh, as I mentioned, the pollinator garden, uh, some of the sites are not accessible on Apley Estate to the public. However, there is a cycle line that runs alongside. We've got an interpretation project, uh, which Caitlin, uh, the intern, will be helping out with a lot. And um, that will tell you about the work that we're doing, some of the species you can see and how uh, it's playing its part in bee lines. There's also the pollinator garden at the Apley Farm Shop, which is also a bit of a platform to talk about the wider work on the estate. Uh, and what that means. Um, and then Rough Park in uh, Telford and, and in Maidley is, is, a, is a communal site, uh, it's accessible. Um, and there will be there will be events um, to learn more and um, get involved with training and such like. So if you would like to be involved, please do drop me an email on my contact details. Oh, okay. secondly, how do farmers react? Um, Overwhelmingly positively. Um, there's a real tipping point in agriculture at the moment. Um, obviously, we do need food production and, uh, you know, there, there, there is a challenge to be, there is a balance there to be brought between food production and wildlife provision, but we can't have one without the other. And uh, I think that's, um, that's becoming clear. And uh, I think farmers are overwhelmingly um, it, keen to get involved and, and from what I've seen and, and hearing about so many farmers coming together to work at the landscape scale, to listen to each other and to um, connect up their habitats, um, that's really heartwarming. And uh, I, I think, especially with policy change, that will just become more commonplace. Um, so yeah, overwhelmingly positive. Okay, so there, there's just lots of um, positive comments now from people about um, about beelines, about the project, and sort of uh, well wishing um, well wishing you on your on your your new project. So there's, oh, there's oh, no brilliant. more there's no more questions for now. So you can you can sort of catch up with those later, Kate, as well. Great. Um, yes. Well, I just like to say then basically thank you to everyone for attending we have been recording this so i will put it on bug life's youtube please don't do go to the bug life website um, there's plenty of resources there there's a farming hub for any landowners who are interested in learning more about what they can do on their land there's some guidance sheets on there for grassland restoration and um, grassland creation as well as um some options for for arable um arable options and there's also a gardening um, hub as well. So people who are interested in learning more about uh, provisioning for, for invertebrates in their gardening, please do head over to the Bug Life website and, and have a look at that. Um, yeah, lots of resources. 
And, and Kate, um, I, I don't know if it's possible to email everyone afterwards, maybe just with the um, the link to the animation as we couldn't um, oh, yes. as we couldn't play it, and perhaps even the the report as well. Yes, That's yeah, possible. I can yeah. definitely do that. So yeah, I will send out a link to the animation and the report, and also a, a couple of um, uh, links to resources and such like. And then you'll all have my contact details as well. Please do reply if you want to be on the mailing list. Great. Um, well, if no one's got any more questions, uh, I will. We will call it an evening. And um, thank you very much for attending. Hope to meet you somewhere along the line in the project. Uh, thanks, Haley, for for the presentation to to kickstart it. And uh, yes, thank you all. Hey, thanks very much, Kate. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.